Praise God. We just <clears throat> just got on live here. We'll give it a minute or two for the people to begin to enter in. Good evening to all of you and uh, greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and our Savior, <clears throat> I mean the Father, His Father and our Father which is in heaven. Praise God. We're, we're thankful for uh, this day. I will said we're to rejoice and be glad in it. And uh, so I just uh, wanted to say a few words of greeting while everyone was was getting on. We're we're still learning, you know, this this um, new era of doing things, you know, broadcasting online. I had a um, a Zoom meeting last Saturday. Uh, several of the brethren got on it, and uh, uh, just a way of brethren trying to stay together and uh, hear from each other. So uh, if you don't know what a Zoom meeting is, it's a, there's a Zoom app that um, many people can get on it at the same time and, and uh, they can talk to each other. Uh, someone can, uh, I use it on in the Dominican Republic, you know, teaching and having Brother, Brother Green uh, interpreting for us and so it's it's a, a tool in our day but it's not something that we've uh, we've used all that much but we're learning to use it during this uh, coronavirus scare that we're uh, experiencing anyway I'm thankful that we're back to having services in our church and we are practicing spacing and and um, you know, trying to be careful, but it certainly feels good to be back in church right now on Sundays, and this coming Sunday, we will have a Sunday morning Bible study at 10 o'clock, and I'm going to have breakfast at 9.30, but we will have coffee and donuts and, and um, possibly some juice. I don't know exactly what the sisters will have uh, prepared there as far as uh, juice or what have you. Anyway, uh, we're looking forward to that. We will practice spacing in the dining room with uh, family sitting together and then those that are not in families. I think we have enough in our room, in our dining room, that we can space from around our tables, uh, three or four people to a table at the most. And then, you know, I think we've got enough tables. We're not going to have regular Bible classes with the youth or um, for right now, we'll we'll try to refrain from that. Anyway, it's just good to be with you this evening, and uh, I thought I might mention something to you. I've been working on, you know, uh, the uh, succession of prophetical events that will have to take place before the end of the world. I pretty well went through that. Uh, it is on our uh, website, uh, and uh, I think Brother Painter saved it to YouTube, and uh, so you can get on there and, and listen to those those broadcasts that we had. I have asked Brother Painter if he can go back and title them, uh, you know, and almost all of them basically are that succession of events that will need to take place. In, that have been prophesied of before the end of the Gentile world. So they could be labeled, you know, the same thing, part one, part two, and so forth. Uh, anyway, I hope we're hopeful to get him to get that done for us. Where if someone wants to go back and go over them, they can. Um, then I have uh, talked a little bit about the beginning with the letters to the churches in Asia, but I'm not going to uh, cover that tonight. Um, uh, the first letters to the church in Ephesus, 
Now, I thought I might say something um, out of the book of Ephesus tonight. Um, you know, uh, that letter was written by the Apostle Paul uh, in the early 60s A.D., so it was uh, several years before A.D. 70. However, uh, the close of that age was coming upon them. It's possible that that church started on Paul's uh, just short visit there, I believe it's in the 18th chapter of um, the book of Acts, and it, possibly Aquila and Priscilla may have uh, got things started there after Paul was there just for a short period of time. Um, you know, Ephesus was a uh, was a great uh, place and uh, uh, there just off the Aegean coast and um, it was a, a very flourishing uh, city I think twice it was the capital of the, of Asia Minor and and uh, so it was a lucrative place and 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 Paul on his third missionary journey there I think spent about three years establishing the church and and later leaving Timothy as the bishop or as the pastor there. So um, it was a very prominent work of the Apostle Paul and um, uh, had great inroads into, into Asia Minor. Um, <clears throat> so later, of course, uh, after Paul's uh, martyrdom, uh, John uh, and, and Timothy, of course, was the pastor there. But John, the Apostle John, uh, took that work over, later became his home, and uh, where it said that uh, Jesus' mother, Mary, was, was also there in Ephesus. Um, but the Apostle Paul wrote, uh, just thinking about uh, these scriptures and in uh, verse five and six, um, one of the things that's been on my mind is the fact that that early church was uh, winding down in, in the harvest that the Lord was, was making um, in the end of that world. And uh, so, uh, you know, I think we can glean some things and, and try to get our mind working on, you know, the very fact that uh, that world, well, we saw that early church that, you know, it was established, uh, the harvest of, of souls that were given a sevenfold light or a complete understanding of the purpose of God and that actually reached into their lives deep enough to um, uh, to to change them in such a way, you know, in the in the uh, fifth seal in the Book of Revelations, it, it talks about those that souls that were under the altar and how that white robes were given to them. And then in the seventh chapter, it talks about this number of people, to me, talking about the new earth uh, people uh, down through the millennium and going on into uh, eternity, that they had washed their robes and made them white. Well, uh, we see in the book of Romans, you know, Paul explaining how that uh, our father Abraham was counted righteous. Righteousness was imputed to him because of faith. He wasn't righteous. Uh, his faith was counted unto him as righteousness. Uh, he, nor even those of us that are striving to, in this work of the Lord, 
we're, we are in the process of washing our robes and making them white. However, we're like this group in the fifth chapter of, of uh, Revela uh, Revelations, uh, excuse me, in the sixth chapter, in the fifth seal, that white robes were given to them. Well, they were they were martyrs down through the dark ages, uh, and uh, they were counted righteous because of their faith and their diligence to serve God under great persecution. And um, uh, you know the Lord wouldn't take vengeance for them. You know, remember they said, "How long, O Lord, holy and true, this have not avenge our blood." Uh, God wasn't going to judge. He's not going to judge the Gentile world until the fullness of the Gentiles come. And he said they'd have to wait a little season until their, to their uh, uh, brothers would suffer in the same way or, or be killed in the same manner. And so uh, they... God counted them righteous, is my point. Uh, they're just. They'll have a great resurrection and the resurrection of the just. And um, so just like you and I, if we're diligent, we remain just. That word just, again, is synonymous with upright, righteous, uh, faithful, um, wise, um, those, those are synonyms that uh, a saint or being holy, uh, those are all, you can link all those words together with uh, the just. And uh, white robes are given to us. Righteousness is imputed to us when we're living by faith and living according to all that we know by faith and serving the and the Lord while we're washing our robes and making them white uh, in the blood of the lamb. We know, you know, that red blood's not going to wash you and make you white, but it's just a picture that the blood of Jesus or the, the righteousness of Christ, his life, that's what the blood stands for, the Old Testament, the, the sacrificial offerings were, off, blood was offered up of them to forgive sins and to sanctify. And that's what made you white or righteous in the eyes of the Lord that uh, that, that was a type of Christ, the work of Christ uh, dying for our sins and becoming that scapegoat. And so you and I are, are blessed today because we're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ or by his life, his, uh, his righteousness, that, the life that he lived in, in the Holy Ghost. And so, uh, but we're, we're working, we're laboring for uh, to be cleansed by the washing of the water of the word. And I was just thinking of Paul in this uh, fifth and sixth chapter here where he was telling them in the 16th verse of Ephesians 5, he said, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Back there in that uh, time frame, uh, there was a lot of persecution. There was a lot of evil taking place in that Roman world. And the uh, Christians were suffering for it. Uh, even like today, we're not in the exact same place because they were in a place where there was a sevenfold light and a, a complete understanding of the things of God. And the Lord's coming was upon them. Uh, in what was called the day of the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> so he was telling them to redeem the time. 
And, but I think we ought to apply that to ourselves today because, uh, you know, time is not, certainly it is getting shorter. And we are headed into a, uh, the day of the Lord and a restored church. But as we enter into that, we're gonna be somewhat in a similar place of these people that were uh, in the latter part of the early church. Uh, and as, the, as things were waning and the church was nearing or falling away, we can see that as the church is restored, somebody said, they came in the front door. We're coming in the back door. They went out the back door, but we're coming in the back door. Uh, and it's so it's different than the way they, they started out on the day of Pentecost with a bright light, a full uh, manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ and a sevenfold light a candlestick light, a perfect understanding of God's word was afforded them by the apostolic ministry back there. And so as the church is restored, we'll have that, but we're gonna be in a similar place um, as, we, as we enter in, we'll be in somewhat of a similar place. So I'm considering some of these things uh, that I'm reading uh, in Paul's writings, the latter part of that uh, work back there. He says, wherefore, verse 17, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Uh, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody, in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, submitting, verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then he, he in, in making that statement of submitting yourselves, he enters right into just the natural order uh, that that the Lord has for a man and his wife and his children. And uh, of course he ends it up, said this is a great mystery, but I'm talking about the church. I've often said that marriage is a beautiful picture of our walk with Christ, the unity that we're to have with Christ. We, uh, we are to be married and that marriage is to be until death do us part. It's to be a ongoing, lifelong commitment. It's a beautiful picture of our walk with the Lord. You know, when you, when you get married, <clears throat> you have to uh, work. You have to work on your marriage. You know, remember Jesus said that he was answering a question of the scribes and Pharisees, I believe, when he, when they were asking him, <clears throat> you know, about a man that, uh, a woman that had been married to a man, he died, and then married to another man, he died, and they wanted to know whose wife she going to be in the resurrection. He said, you do err, not, not know, understanding the scriptures. <clears throat> and he said, uh, he, he told them that, uh, and, and uh, I think also, I may be thinking of the scripture where uh, uh, Moses granted the right for divorcement. But Jesus told them, he said, it's not, it wasn't so in the beginning. A man was to leave his mother and his father and they uh, two to be, were to be joined together and become one flesh. Now, those of us that's been married a long time, I've been married, I've been, me and my wife been together now 50, uh, 53 years, I'll say that, that I, we, we're right on the verge of that, but we've been, we, you know, we were courting it that long ago. And um, 
Um, and you certainly have to work on a marriage. It, it doesn't just work out. You know, I've heard a few people in my lifetime that have made the statements. I'm talking about older people said, me and my husband's never had an argument. Well, I'm not sure I can believe that because I don't know of anybody that come together and don't have to work on their relationship. You have to work on your relationship with, with Jesus Christ. Um, you know, you, you have to work on understanding the Lord, understanding the Lord's ways and, you know, there's many, many different pieces of the puzzle in everyone's mind that everyone's putting this, this puzzle together concerning God and God's purpose, not only overall for all of creation, but for each one of us individually. And it's not something you come by easily or no, uh, have a complete understanding of it overnight. And then as you get to know the Lord, you have to learn his ways. And, and there's some things that the Lord does that we don't understand. And we have to accept uh, the Lord's working. Sometimes we get a greater understanding as time goes on. Sometimes we never understand the full wisdom of God because he has a foreknowledge that we don't have and so trust comes into effect. But the Lord here is, I mean, John, I'm, I'm sorry, the apostle Paul is telling them to submit themselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. And then he, he touches on some very basic principles. Verse 22 says, wives submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own to their own husbands and everything. Well, you know, unless you get a balance to this, you know, I mean, if a man just goes off saying, you know, well, my wife has to obey me, she's got to listen to me, I'm the head and take that kind of attitude, they're missing it all together. Uh, because if you look at the very next verse, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Well, so uh, here he's working on unity He's working how to accomplish unity, but he's working on uh, each one of us in the fear of the Lord. Remember, he started this off, said, submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of the Lord. In other words, you treat one another, and he tells which ones are to be the other to each other. And that we are to, uh, you know, have have this spirit of submission in the fear of God that, you know, I'm supposed to, if, if I'm in charge of anything, I'm supposed to have the mind of the Lord. I'm supposed to be very careful in the fear of God that, that the Lord is watching me and, and that I'm supposed to be doing this as, as the Lord would do it. And then whoever I'm submitting to that's over me, I'm supposed to submit to them as unto the Lord. And so it's a joint effort. Uh, that's the way marriage is, to, to gain unity, even with Christ as we're striving to uh, for the Lord's will, purpose in our lives. I certainly don't believe that the Lord is uh, just wanting to be someone's boss and to have everybody do everything his way. I just think he wants us to be wise and righteous in all that we do and do it like he would do it because that's how he'd do it. He'd do it wise and righteously. Yet at the same time, we're all individuals. 
and not Christ doesn't expect us to do everything exactly like he does it. He just expects us to learn the way to walk righteously in all that we do. And he doesn't expect us to have that achieved, you know, as a babe in Christ, but he expects us to grow and develop and get there. And so, <clears throat> uh, well, it is true that, you know, that here's a picture in the church that, you know, if we're going to become a part of the bride of Christ, that's one of the allegories that the Bible depicts of uh, those that's going to rule and reign with him. They're called the bride of Christ. Um, there's a picture there, and that's what Paul's getting at is the picture of Christ and the church of learning the order of God. Uh, I've, you know, there's a scripture in the 13th chapter, no, excuse me, of uh, Corinthians. Is that in the 11th chapter? Um, uh, concerning the order of God. And, and uh, so, <clears throat> the, you know, the Lord's wanting us to to develop in a way where um, it's so different than than the way man does things. Uh, you know, the the Lord is so patient, uh, <clears throat> and he what he requires is that we grow and develop. righteously uh, and that this submitting we're talking about is a voluntary submission. It's not something that can be uh, forever demanded, dictated to, or, or required. <clears throat> it is required, but it, it in other words, if, if you're having to make someone like a child, if you if he goes into children obeying your parents here in just a little while, but he is showing that um, um, you you know, in other words, we do have to start out serving God through some commandments, and the Lord may have to chastise us to some extent. He may require. He can. We're his children. He's got a right to chastise us. He's got a right to deal with us. If he loves us, he's going to try to help us. And it may take chastisement uh, at, at times. However, uh, you know, God wants us to grow to a place to where we come to a place of understanding of the order of God and the righteousness of God. In fact, eventually you shouldn't need a tutor. You eventually shouldn't need a teacher. You eventually shouldn't need a, a minister if you've came up to the fullness of what God's ministry uh, affords you with. Uh, that you come to a place that your uh, your submission to the Lord is is through your knowledge and your uh, growth to wisdom. And finally, it's worked righteousness into you where you automatically have no problem with understanding uh, how to walk with God and, and walk in his righteousness and do his will. And so here where Paul's dealing with, you know, this, this submission, uh, you know, and you can compare it. You can compare it somewhat to, to natural things in life, just like a job. You can learn a job well enough that your boss don't have to tell you what to do. You know what to do. You know everything required of you, and you can do it, and you can do it to the T. You can, you can grow in God that way, where righteousness is developed in you in such a way that um, that you understand walking in righteousness 
and it's become a part of you. It's not something you have to do. It's something that you do because it's the right thing to do. However, I've said many times that God is so unique in the way that he created us as individuals. I've often used the, you know, the, the fingerprint. How that every one of us, it's amazing to me that there's not any two fingerprints alike. Well, there's not two, any two individuals just alike. That's why I like to use that verse in, in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation concerning those in the early church that overcame, it says by the word of their testimony. I use that over and over just to remind the people that nobody has your fingerprint and nobody has your testimony. You're the only person that has lived your life. You're the only one that has your mind your mind is developed through environment experiences and, and knowledge, uh, understanding that you've come to, whether it's natural or whether it's, uh, whether it's godly. And of course, we, we want our, our uh, understanding developed in the things of God. So here the Apostle Paul uh, he tells husbands to love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. In other words, we're to try to live a life where we're, we're not demanding, but we're trying to harmonize and understand our place and our position, our responsibility uh, unto the Lord and unto righteousness. And uh, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, have, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. In other words, there's not, there's no, there is no sin. There is no fault in us when we reach this glorious place that God's asking us to submit ourselves in, while we develop without a blemish. So ought men, see he's showing this, men are to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself and no man ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes even the Lord the church. So all what God puts us over, we're uh, whoever you are. You know, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, uh, a husband, if you're, if you're a leader, if you're an elder, or you're, you know, a wife or over uh, the household, the children. Uh, and we all are to cherish and develop in what God's called us to. For he says, we're members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. <clears throat> uh, He ends that up saying, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Of course he's talking to God's people. You can't get this to work in an ungodly family or a, or a, <clears throat> a family where only one person is serving God. That's a difficult situation. <clears throat> but this is God's intent. Uh, for how the church is to grow together in God's order and how that a family is to grow together in God's order. Then he says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that, that it may be well with thee and thou mayst live along on earth. Well, 
You know, if children are brought up correctly and learn obedience at a young age, uh, and they learn how to obey in school, they learn how to obey on the job, things are going to go well with them. If they learn how to be faithful and obedient under those that are over them, even if they're not godly, uh, God can direct you in, in places in life where I remember one time I had a man under my ministry. He, we um, The Lord moved me uh, one time over 700 miles from the church I was pastoring and uh, I believe it was seven families that moved with me. I didn't ask them to. I didn't really even want them to. <laughs> but I couldn't, I couldn't, that's what they elected to do and I couldn't deny them that. They'd been faithful to me. And so we made a 700 mile move and, and started a little all over again in another state. And um, this one man that was very faithful to me, he began to look for a job. He couldn't find a job. He came to me one day. I was I was painting in a little town, painting uh, the, actually the police station. I was in the back in the back, painting the back wall of that building. And he stopped by there. He knew where I was. Visited with me. He said, "Brother Smith, I've looked for jobs and nobody. I haven't found a job. I'm having a hard time finding a job." And uh, he had a fairly large family, and and. Uh, I listened to him and I said, if you'll do what I tell you, God will give you a job and you'll be successful. He said, all right, what do I need to do? I said, you get up in the morning and you get up every day and you can look for a job. You just start going to stores and different places, wherever you feel that you could possibly talk to somebody, you go in there and ask if they have any openings, if you can make an application for a job. And I said, the first person that wants to hire you, take the job. I don't care if they're paying minimum wage. He said, I can't live on minimum wage. I said, I know that. But if you'll do that, and then you work for that person like you're working for the Lord, you do them a good job. I said, I'll guarantee you, you won't work there in no time that somebody will recognize and see what kind of employee you are and somebody will offer you a better job. He said, I'm going to do what you said. I said, do it. God will bless you. Of course, I was speaking somewhat in faith, but I knew in the natural, I knew that what I was saying was right, but I needed the Lord's help to help him as well as quickly as possible. And he, he went the next day and got a job making minimum wage. <laughs> but he did what I said. He gave, he did a good job. And there was a man in that place that saw him. And, and, and when he kind of got alone, he asked him. He said, uh, would you like to have a better job? And he said, well, anybody would like to have a better job. He said, I'd like to hire you. And that guy hired him, making more money, harder work. He went to work for that man. He worked there for a few months, and then somebody, a door opened for him, and he was given a better job, which he worked there for over 20 years and got a retirement there and was a, was a leading man, a boss on the job. It's just because that he followed these principles, learning how to be obedient. You see, he was an obedient child. He had a godly father and godly parents, and they taught him obedience, and he obeyed, and that caused him to be successful in life on his job. It works that way in the kingdom of heaven. The Lord takes notice. You know, the, uh, the little story of Ruth. 
You know, she was obedient. She obeyed Naomi. She saw the principles in that family. And she wanted what they had. And when she went back to Israel with her and began to glean in the field of Boaz, Naomi told her what to do and what not to do. And Boaz told her what to do and not to do. He told her, don't you go in any other fields. You only clean in these. My, you, you stay with my men and my harvest. And she was obedient. And she was faithful. And he noticed her. And that's a picture of the Lord noticing us. Gleaning in the field of God's harvest. And God, you know, you remember what he told her? You remember what he told he told her? He said, You you keep gleaning in this field. And he said, When you get thirsty, he said, I've charged my young men not to not to hurt you in any way. When you get thirsty, you come to the water pots and get a drink. That's the kind of church God's building in the true body of Jesus Christ. He's calling a ministry that will not hurt, will not usurp, but they'll love their wives in type, the church, just like Jesus loved the church. And you can get a drink. You can get blessed in the spirit anytime. There's plenty of water, plenty of the spirit of God. And, and then he told her, don't go in any other field. She obeyed him. You know what he told his, his, his uh, reapers? He said, see that little girl over here? He said, kick off a few handfuls off the wagon, extra for her. And that's what will happen to you if you have that kind of spirit of working, learning the order of God and working with God. And those even sometimes... You know, I can say this. My wife, if she could be here beside me, I think she would attest to it. I've never disobeyed a pastor I ever sat under. That I've had pastors tell me to do things that I knew they were wrong, and I obeyed them. Because they were greater men than I was, and they weren't perfect, and they, they made some mistakes. But I was more than willing to take the good I could get from them, from what little mistakes they might make. Doesn't that make sense? I can tell you I never disobeyed men that was over me in the Lord. I never caused a ruckus. I never was rebellious. I'm thankful somehow obedience was put in my life at a young age. I saw the benefit in it. I see the benefit of it in, king, in God's kingdom. Oh, mainly what I'm talking about here is Jesus and the church. I'm talking about principles of how to get ahead in the kingdom of heaven. Paul was trying to give that church at Ephesus, you know, when John wrote them that last letter, the first of the seven letters in the book of Revelations. He, he started off, I believe, by saying, I know thy works. Let me, just, let me just read that to you real quick, and I'll close with this thought. <clears throat> it's in the second chapter. very first words in second verse in his letter to him said, I know thy works. I know your deeds. I know your behavior. I've watched you. You know, we used to sing a song, there's an all seeing eye watching you, watching you. Well, God's eyes on his children. And thy labor. I've watched your struggles. And thy patience. They were going through many things at the time John wrote that. And how thou canst not bear them that are evil. You know, you can love, you can grow so fond and in love with righteousness that evil is just a something you can't hardly bear. You 
can't really stand to be around it. You just want to get away from it. Well, God, God watched that in that church. My, they sat under the great apostle Paul for three years, and then Timothy, which was his son in the gospel. And I would almost say when, when you saw Timothy work, you saw the apostle Paul working. That church was highly blessed. There's men coming on the scene in this next generation, some even in this generation, that are great men of God, that the people of God are blessed to sit under. And so I'm thankful to be a part, aren't you? Praise God. Let's, let's keep these principles in our life. You can, you know, one of the things that he told Ephesus in that letter, when he told them they'd left their first love, he told them they were lukewarm to go do their first works over. Well, see, a relationship in, in a marriage or any relationship can go cold. It can get lukewarm. And the Lord told them he's going to spew them out of his mouth. They didn't do something about it. You can, you can destroy a relationship. You can let it get cold on you. And uh, it's something that we all have to work on. You know, I, I was thinking about one of the things, thoughts that hit me to, this evening before we started this broadcast was um, children. My, what an experience raising children. And, and here's one of the things about children. They're yours for as long as you live. <laughs> I don't care how old they are. They're your kids. Their problems are your problems. But they do grow up and they do become, uh, they become, uh, individuals. They have their own life. Boy, one of the hard things about parents is when your kids get grown, they start doing things that you don't want them to do. They want to move off somewhere in the wild blue yonder and chase a dream. And it's so hard to let them go. It's so hard to lose that relationship, you know, because it, it, it I mean, when kids get away from you, it's just hard to maintain that. And you got to let them go, you know. All you can do sometimes is turn them over to the Lord and say, God, they're yours. I give them to you. I'm asking you to watch over them and help them. You're fortunate if you kept yours and able to keep them close, but most people don't aren't able to keep them all right up close. It's such a blessing when you can, but it's not always possible. And that doesn't mean that it's always wrong. You know, God loves all of his children. And, and no matter what we do, that's the thing I was telling you about individuality, your testimony. You can do wrong. And I'm not saying that this is all wrong, but I can say you can do something that's not God's will and he'll stick with you and he'll help you work it out and he'll help you turn something that's not so good into something that's great. That's the kind of God we serve. So, you know, if your children aren't doing everything you want them to do today, just pray for them, especially if they're grown and doing what they feel is right. And you have to pray and trust them and, you know, kind of give them counsel as, 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 that they want. But you always don't always know that what they're doing, it could be the hand of the Lord on them. So you have to be fearful. You know, submit yourself to one another in the fear of the Lord. <laughs> so a lot of this is by faith. Anyway, God bless your hearts. Uh, let me remind you of our some of our prayer requests before we close off here this evening. Brother Shelby Weaver in our church had a stroke yesterday, and he's in St. Vincent's ICU unit. He is stable. Uh, the report that I got from him today, I haven't been able to go see him yet. They won't let 
they, they weren't letting anybody in, but they're letting one person a day in, but, but they already had someone there today and I couldn't see him. So would you pre, please pray for Brother Shelby Weaver? Uh, he needs our prayers and, and uh, let's pray. I think they got to him fairly soon. And so hopefully, you know, he won't have any, uh, he is suffering some paralysis on his left side, but we're hoping and praying that that they'll be able to reverse some of that. They did get to him right away from my understanding. Uh, Sister Amber Ratliff needs our prayers. Sister Brenda Ratliff needs our prayers. Um, uh, remember Brother Gary Wright, uh, who else needs, um, pray for me. Oh, Brother John Kennedy was taken to the hospital. I think he may have had a light stroke. He's having some pretty severe vertigo. I certainly understand that. I Pray for me. I'm still undergoing quite a bit of vertigo. Uh, I can do pretty good in normal activity, but any quick movement, you know, looking down, looking up, turning, um, stepping down off of a step, I, I'm still very unstable that way, and I just you just have to learn how to live with it. But thank God I am much better than I was. So, but keep praying for me. Um, we will have service again. I'll mention it one more time. We will have service, Bible study. We'll have coffee and donuts, and maybe juice, and I, I don't know what else might be uh, lightly prepared, but. There won't be any cooking breakfast uh, right now, uh, but we will. We're going to do that. We will have proper spacing in the in the dining dining room. No other Bible classes. It'll all be held in the big dining room. Uh, Nine thirty is regular. Ten o'clock Bible study. Eleven o'clock there'll be a band practice and uh, eleven thirty service Sunday. Looking forward to seeing you all there. Hi, Sister Lucas. God bless your heart. Sister Betty Layton, I see you on there every week. God bless you. We're certainly glad to to uh, be connected with you still. Precious sister in Texas. I wish I had her right up here in our church. <laughs> her and her daughter, Tansy, and her husband. Anyway, God bless your hearts, all of you. Keep praying for the Dominican Republic. Most of the uh, works, uh, missionary works, many of them are suffering to some extent where we've got people suffering i've been giving i've, I've doled out for over four thousand dollars in the last month in the dominican republic trying to help with food rice and beans and there's so many of them not eating and they're not able um uh, you know they're not working there's many of them out of work and many of them are hungry many of them some of us went days without food we found out about it. We get stuck, began to help them. Thank you for those of you that have sent in missionary offerings to help us with that endeavor. God bless your hearts. I'll see you Sunday morning. Uh, we used to say shake hands and be friendly, but I'll say wave. God bless your hearts. Have a good evening. Good night.